I see Fotis as the first person, so you should be able to unmute now. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just very, very quick question. Like, um, most of the interviews are nowadays like happening online, which means um, there should be transcripts, you know, like there, there, there should be all types of additional functionalities that go with an interview and along an interview just to assess the quality both of the interviewee and the interviewer. Uh, my experience with it is that like um, I had an interview, very big company, really wanted to work with them. Basically, every single question and every single answer after that company was kind of released to a competitor company. And I could see like very, very relevant LinkedIn posts uh, being posted like literally the next day, which kind of meant that something must have kind of slipped during that interview process. Um, what's the best way to kind of get access to that type of material and to get an, a framework in place so that both interviewer and interviewee uh, do, do, do adhere to specific principles when interviewing? Yeah, okay, so there's not much we can do about the quality of the interviewer, right? Like there is a very clear power dynamic if you're the candidate, you're the one being judged, you're the one being evaluated, the company has more power. So the thing that you can do actionably is I want you to have leverage by talking to 10 companies. So even if, probably if you talk to 10 or 20 companies, I promise you one of, maybe multiple of the interviewers you have are going to be mean, they're gonna be absent-minded, they're gonna ignore you, just gonna be a very bad experience. You should expect that. I don't think it's worth trying to fix that problem. I think uh, what you can do is, on your end is number one, don't care about that much about the interviewer. And number two, use things like Glassdoor or Taro, like talk to people in the community, talk to your network and figure out what are the kinds of questions that this company will ask. And if you do that, I think you're able to, um, you know, avoid this situation where like, oh, all the things were leaked and I like totally didn't know. And now I'm at a disadvantage compared to other people who had access to that. But hopefully that helps. Okay, Burnema, go ahead. Yeah. So my quick question again, uh, so uh, uh, did, so I'm not uh, interviewing with FANG companies. Uh, I'm sharing my experience with the non-FANG companies. So uh, um, all rounds are around, uh, all interviews are around five or six rounds. And I find myself the interviewers are repeating the same questions in every round. And if, if each round is around 45 minutes or one hour, they ask two lead code questions and uh, last 15 minutes behavioral rounds where they kind of, you know, bombard me with questions as if I have to immediately retrieve the answers from my memory. And it is extremely difficult experience of, you know, interviewing with the non-fan companies because in my experience, they don't have the experience of interviewing the candidates. Uh, and in, in one experience, I have like lead code question. I was solving on the online platform and that had uh, compilation issues like the compiler was not working and the interviewer was not able to help me so uh, I mean I don't know I, I should stop interviewing because this is not I, I feel that I'm wasting my time with this kind of interviews where I'm bound to fail yeah, I can take this one. So as Rahul mentioned, you can't control the quality of the interviewers and a lot of interviewers are bad. This is actually covered in the course. This is an important thing to make peace with, which is most interviewers are bad. And yeah, as you mentioned, um, when it comes to fan companies, yes, there's a lot of mean, very almost evil interviewers at Fang. But the thing about big tech is the interview process is standardized and interviewers are trained. And like, you know, at Meta, we had to be reverse shadowed and go through all this other stuff in order to be certified as an interviewer and like a janky non fang company that doesn't happen. So, you know, my advice is just kind of the mentality thing from before. Just, just don't let things get to you. Just be Zen. Like sometimes you'll go into an interview where you have no chance of passing because the interviewers are just terrible people. And that, that happens all the time. Um, my advice with behavioral, like, but going back to the tactics of, you know, they expect you to retrieve the answer from memory immediately. Well, that's true for any interviewer. That applies to Fang as well. You can't just like sit there for like three, four, five minutes and just like not speak, um, which is why I think it's very important. Of course, have the right mentality, take care of yourself, but also do mocks because uh, I talk about this in the course of prepared state versus dynamic state. 
there's going to be a lot of questions where you've never seen it before. But like, of course, you have to answer it immediately, <laughs> right? You need to come up with something on the spot and you need to train your ability to essentially think on the fly and come up with answers on the fly. And uh, there's two big ways to do that. Number one, do a lot of mock interviews. Number two, constantly uh, give yourself questions you've never seen before when studying, especially with mocks. You can, if, you, if you're doing a behavioral mock, Go to the, you know, whoever's giving you the mock and be like, okay, I've studied these 10 questions. I actually want you to give me a, a question from this list of these 10 questions I've actually never seriously thought about. So I want to be surprised. You know, pick one of these 10 questions that, you know, I don't know, or, or 25 questions, right? Um, the bigger, the better, because a higher chance of you being surprised. Um, and yeah, that's just, that's just what you have to do the work, right? And it, it's hard for me to describe, but it's kind of like training a muscle, right? If you want to be able to run a five minute mile, you just keep running a ton of miles, right? And then like the, the your leg muscles will become stronger over time. It's the same thing with your brain for interviews. If you are constantly putting yourself into situations where you're getting like wacky questions you've never seen before, eventually you'll develop the, the nimbleness of being able to tackle any question you've seen before. And behavioral is the classic playground where you're going to get a bunch of questions that just make no sense or like you've never seen before. Yeah, but I, I personally never had a problem with behavioral interviews. I've gotten curveballs left and right because I've done a very good job over time of just building up that dynamic state and just putting myself in situations where like I've never seen it before and I have no idea what's going on. And I um, networked a lot. You know, I, I, I'm always talking, trying to network with people and like add value to people and make friends with people who I, I don't really know. That forces me to think on the fly and adapt to the conversation, right? Because I don't know who this person is. You know, I need to like kind of learn you know, their mannerisms or personality, what they like on the fly, right? So just like networking, that is actually so powerful because not only does networking help you like get interviews, right? You can get more referrals, but it also builds up your communication and social skills, which is mm -hmm. largely what behavioral interviews are. You're just trying to see like what level of charisma you have in your communication abilities. Yeah, I love it. That's a great answer. Okay, Tom. Hello, first of all, thank you for this, for the presentation. I have a question regarding, uh, I guess coding, coding interview preparation. So a few years ago, cracking the coding interview was enough to get a job at Fang. Not anymore. I remember when I when I was studying for interviews uh, a year and a half ago, this co this course, cracking the coding interview, was extremely helpful. And now I see like this course even has evolved to provide. But by the way, this course like provides like coding patterns for like solving uh, coding questions. This co this course now provides like patterns that are like more advanced, like monotonic stack. I don't know, the union set, order set. So I'm wondering, do you see this trend like for this interview becoming more and more difficult, like reaching maybe the competitive like programming level style questions? Yeah, I, that, that is a trend. That is absolutely happening in the past 15 years where um, the, the awareness of DSA was so low. It like required people to think on their feet more and it like favored those few people who had frankly like college degrees at top universities who had gone through algorithm uh courses but now that knowledge is so commonly understood and there's so many courses that any youtuber out there is going to have please buy my dsa course and i'm not saying that those are not valuable but what that means is that um everyone is going to get better at that skill and companies are therefore having to raise the bar in order to figure out who they actually want to take so i think uh i guess i have two things to say on that one is yeah that is happening and i think there's an arms race and you have to just get better and better um, and the second thing is that if you choose not to play that game, then I think you have to figure out alternative path or companies which have alternative forms of evaluation. And by that, I mean like startups, which are usually a bit more open or flexible to, oh, let's just do a take home. Let's do an actual practical coding assessment instead of leak code or competitive programming, which is, I think, you know, where things are, are trending. Right. And I think also that means that we should try to keep up with this coding interview skills, even when you're not looking for a job. Mm, yeah, I don't know about that because I feel like keeping up with coding skills is like a parasitic activity where it's like not really helping you with your main project at Google or Microsoft or, you know, Facebook. Like it, it, those things that you um, prepare for don't actually help you get a good rating at the company. So if you're content and you plan to stay at a company for two or three years, which is what I recommend anyone do if they're at a mid-level or higher, but you should plan to stay put, then I think that you actually don't, like I actively think you should not spend too much of your week doing DSA. I would instead rather you focus on 
you know, working with your manager, working with your team, communication within the team. That's how you'll get promoted. And when you do want to do interview prep again, then I think you can really sprint on it and like get good after like a couple months of prep. Got it. Thank you for the input. Yeah, thanks. Oh, all right, uh, Vikram. Oh, sorry. Try unmuting again. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So as a rising junior preparing for summer 2025 internship interviews, so based on the time scheduling you guys were talking about earlier, would you adjust anything about that for internship interview prep, both before and after the applications open? Um, I, I think a lot of the advice still applies. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I admittedly don't have too much visibility into like how the, um, internship like interviews work. It's been really crazy for interns. So, uh, from my understanding, hiring is contracted. And even for people who get in, the number of return offers is lower. And we have a course about how to get a return offer as an intern, by the way. Um, but I think, uh, what I recommend for, uh, college students in particular is, networking is really important like this market is extremely bad for junior engineers like astronomically terrible like i still know a good amount of college students and like the career fairs are like a lot thinner so i know it's hard and th this was me so like a lot of computer science students are like pretty shy <laughs> and like therefore not very good at networking and that was me but the the the, the sad thing is that well the, the painful thing is that when you're in college it's literally the easiest time to network literally because when you're in college, I'm, I'm assume like you're returned back to the campus. I think most people are. COVID's not really a problem anymore. You are literally surrounded by people who are studying the exact same thing, taking the same courses, and they're around the same age, and they're oftentimes from the same location. Because a lot of people, most people, prefer to go to a college like you know nearby, like in the same state or province or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you have all this kind of free solidarity. So I just recommend like networking like as much as possible. And then when it comes to preparation. I, I honestly don't know what internship interviews look like. I mean, for Fang, obviously it's like DSA based. So if you think you could, like if Fang companies are coming into your career fairs and they are giving most people, most students a chance, then obviously you need to like break out the lead code um, and grind through that. But like startups will hire interns too. And I think for most startups, especially if it's early stage, they probably won't ask as much lead code, in which case side projects will be more helpful because it's more practical coding. But yeah, I don't think there's anything in particular that's special about like looking for internships, you know, applying to them and preparing for them compared to everyone else. I think a lot of the advice we gave is still the same. And the difference is that networking is just way easier for a college student than it is for like people who've graduated and are now in the market and just, you know, they've spread out and moved to different places to work at different jobs. Yeah. Youth is an advantage. Take advantage of being young and saying, Hey, yep. <laughs> look at, I'm, a, I'm a college. You're a junior. I think Vikram, right? so I'm a junior. I'm starting on my career. I'm so eager to learn like that. Like, you know, as a 32 year old, I feel like I can't get away with that anymore, Yep. <laughs> but maybe you can. So I think, yeah, I think that's a good answer. Um, you know, college fair, like the job fair that you have at your college, that's a big one. And I think the other unfair advantage that you have as a college kid is your alumni network. Like if you go out and say, hey, I'm a Stanford student, you're a Stanford alum, please help me. I'll help you. <laughs> so yeah, okay, yeah. We... Just give it a shot, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Give it a shot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go, go to the clubs, form study groups. That's a big one. You know, you can meet people, you can meet other students at career fairs, you can help each other do mocks, review each other's resumes, you know, and then oftentimes like, you know, a floor of a college dorm is like a common area, right? You just hang out there, you know, just, just say hi to people optimistically, just, just meet people, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right. Let's do one last question. Yeah, last one. Then last we one. will uh, wrap it up. Okay. So Priyanka, yep. you're Sa Sasha, Will, Eric, I'm sorry. We'll, um, you know, we'll try and do more of these live things soon. And also of course, Taro is, is where Alex and I spend most of our time, but okay. Priyanka, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for the platform, uh, Rahul, Alex. Uh, so my question is, um, I've never really had trouble uh, re receiving offers, right? Uh, like over the past three years, I've received almost like 10 offers, you know, and I've, oh. uh, the, 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 my previous work, uh, my previous uh, company where I worked at was really good. I gained a lot of experience really fast because it was a startup, uh, but it so soon turned toxic. So I had to move to a different company and right now I feel like I've stagnated a lot in terms of learning and I'm sort of not enjoying my work and so uh, basically how do you uh, choose companies that 
actually that, that that lets you solve complex problems right so i've always had that trouble uh, i mean i i could never really filter out companies where when i would enjoy the work more rather than uh, yeah uh, where it's not just about money or work life balance yeah okay so i would say a couple things one is that um reputations matter like there's a reason why Fang has a good reputation and there are things you can take issue with, uh, of course, but like for the most part, Fang is prestigious and has a good reputation because the people are smart, you get paid well, and there is some sort of interesting work that happens. And so I think, you know, relying on that, if you go to some company, I don't want to call out any company in particular, but like if you go to a company which doesn't have as good a brand, yeah, I mean, like it might be harder for you to find interesting work with smart people. So that's one part of it. The other thing I would say is that um, oftentimes like leaving your job is the nuclear option where it's like, okay, I'm going to like literally leave and do all this high friction work to go join another company. If you're working at Meta, there are a lot of teams at Meta or Google, I guarantee you, which are just very, very boring. I know people at those teams and they're just not happy. And so I think just be creative about, hey, can you either invent a role at the company. And uh, I think a lot of the best engineers actually are able to do that. Where it's like, hey, I can like, I have this passion. I had this problem I've identified. I'm going to create my own project or team perhaps. Or can you switch to a team, which is more interesting? So like, you know, ML, AI is super hot right now. So can you figure out how to network with the right people, the right manager, so you can actually switch into a more interesting area for you? So those are kind of, and I guess, yeah, I guess like the other thing I would say is just talk to people. Like talk to people if you're evaluating a company, Talk to your friends, talk to um, people who have worked there in the past and get their honest opinion about what kind of work um, they did at that company and if it could be an interesting fit for you. Okay, yeah, that's good advice. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, I think that's it. So I wanted to say one last thing is that um, I really missed doing this, Alex, with you over the past. I think we haven't done it in like seven or eight months. So. This is super fun. I loved, you know, seeing the questions and just presenting. So um, I'm hoping we can do this more. If you found it helpful, here's what I would request. One is just connect, follow us on LinkedIn. We'd love to keep that relationship alive. Of course, if you want to join Taro, that's even better. That's where I spend, both Alex and I spend a lot of our time every week just answering questions on Taro, which we love doing. And then also, if you found it valuable, please take a screenshot of what you're looking at right now or a screenshot of anything else that you saw today and then tag us on LinkedIn. Tell us tell us and other people what you liked or what was insightful. And I think it'll really be able to help your own network. And then we'll also try and amplify you if you, if you tag us or if you share it. Okay. Alex, any last remark? Yeah, I always say at the end of these sessions that, I mean, this session was free. We, we didn't charge you a penny to get in, but you, all of you, you know, especially the ones who stuck around for the Q&A an hour and a half, you gifted us your time, right? And we hope that we were able to exchange that time with wisdom that actually helps you with the job search and gets you an offer. Like this economy is brutal. It has been so hard for me, you know, mentoring all the engineers in the Taro community and seeing all this pain, right? Um, so... Yeah, I hope this was helpful for you. If you want to go even deeper, you know, you, I shared a special link to get to our premium. You unlock the full course, you unlock office hours, the resume events, DSA events, all this other stuff to support you on your journey. Job searches are long. Like most people are taking three, six, nine, 12 months to find a job in this market. And Taro is here for you every, every step of the way. But yeah, thanks for joining Rahul and I on this Saturday or Sunday. I don't know. It's probably Sunday somewhere in the world and uh, listening to us ramble for an hour and a half. Appreciate it. <laughs> hey, okay, thank you. And let's, we have our tradition here. So what I'm going to do now yeah. is allow everyone to unmute and everyone can unmute, say whatever you want for 30 seconds and then I'll end the call. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Okay. Thank you. Bye everyone, see thanks, you. Bro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I need a job. Burger, you know, burger.